And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now they was the son of the Ephraimite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight, everybody say eight. Eight, eight sons. And the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. Look at the first part of verse 12 and just leave that up the entire service. It says, now David. Now David. I want to preach a little while tonight, Adam, from the subject of now David. Because the God I serve is a right now God. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. God wants to move in the now. All you have in your life is right now. All that matters is now. All that, all that you need is right now. But so many times we miss the now because we choose to, choose to dwell on what we came from or what we're headed to. Can I tell you that the past only exists in your memory and the future only exists in your imagination? The only thing you have is right now. But so many people are letting the memory of what they came from talk them out of experiencing God right now. Help me preach this Holy Ghost. So many times God has wanted to move for you in the now and you can't get over what you went through back then. And there are people that always bring up where you came from and what you did wrong. And if people ain't bringing it up, the accuser's bringing it up. And if the enemy's not bringing it up, your own heart is bringing it up. Your own conscience is bringing it up. And you are talking yourself out of experiencing God right now. You're talking yourself out of what God wants to do for you right now. And yet we live in a day where if we're not tormented by our past or troubled by our past, there's a group of people that are worried about the future. They're so worried about the future. Faith is not knowing the future. Faith is knowing the God that holds the future. I'm going to tell you, faith is knowing that my future is in the hands of God. And when I can't trust CNN, I can trust Jesus. I told you last week how the weather channels and the news channels were going to try to put fear in people. Did I not tell y'all that? And you know, it did hit bad, but it didn't hit nowhere near as bad as what they were calling for it to hit. One lady got so tormented over the news report that she had a heart attack and died. Not because of the storm, but because she sat there and watched what the storm may do. And though the storm never affected her house, the fear got on her so great that she had a heart attack and died. Another gentleman got in a panic. And he went and got him a generator, and he tried to hook it up. And as he was trying to hook up the generator, he got electrocuted and died. And the storm never even came over his house. But in, in fear of what was going to happen, hear me now, somebody, he had a heart attack and died. I'm trying to show you how the enemy works. He tries to put a fear forecast in your future. But can I tell you, when God is in your life, there is no fear in your future. I need you to give God a praise if you know your future. How many of you saw the weather forecaster? They called it, it went by. The weather forecaster. It was raining and he was, the wind was blowing him. Did y'all see that? And he was acting like it was torrential downpours. And you looked at that weather forecaster and you said, oh God, this is the apocalypse. We ain't going to make it. America's going to be blown off the map. And he's just, man, it just looks like he can't stand up. And all of a sudden, two teenagers drinking a cup of cola walk by him. And then common sense hits you. And you think, how can the wind be knocking him down right there where Robbie's at? And two teenagers walking behind him and their clothes ain't even blown. Then you begin to realize uh, he's making it look worse than it is. I'm preaching right now. Two angels get ready to walk by your screen and say the devil is a liar. He's making it look worse than it is. Uh, somebody give God a praise if you know that's how the enemy works. The enemy is a master of making a mountain out of a molehill. I'm preaching to myself right now. He can take a little thing. Bible called it little foxes. By the time you're done dwelling on it, by the time you're done meditating on it, he's going to take a little molehill, turn it into a mountain of fear and a mountain of unbelief. Here, the people of Israel are captivated by a voice, by a forecast. The voice of Goliath, who every morning and every night would stand and curse them and defy the armies of God. Why does the enemy do that? Because
he tries to captivate your thoughts in the morning. And he tries to captivate your thoughts before you go to bed. Why? Because he knows what you wake up thinking about, you go to bed thinking about, will dominate your life. That's why David said as soon as he woke up, he gave God a praise. And before he went to bed at night, he gave God a praise. Because what he was declaring is, I'm going to let my sleep be saturated in the presence of God. And if I wake up in the morning, I'm not going to dread it. I'm going to declare this is a day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice. And be glad in it. Uh, there's a way to flip the script of the enemy. But here the Philistine, one voice, has defied a whole army. Not because he's powerful, but because he knows how to run that mouth. The enemy is a master of running the mouth. And right in the middle of all that, it seems like the whole text is about Goliath and how the Philistines are overshadowing Israel and Israel's captivating in fear. And then all of a sudden, out of left field, y'all, the Bible says, now David, it seems grammatically incorrect to be studying with one train of thought. And the next thing you know, Samuel starts talking about another character. It seems like he was just having a bad case of ADD. And he started talking about something that didn't make no sense. But Samuel was showing how God will burst on the scene. Can I prophesy to you in this hour that we live in? I know people want to talk about how bad the youth is and how bad politics are and how bad it is in Washington. But can I prophesy the word of the Lord to you and tell you that, that there's going to be some now Davids that are going to raise up in this hour. You didn't see them coming and you counted them out. But God's about ready to raise up some people. David just burst, boom, just burst on the scene. But to understand the necessity of David, you have to understand the backdrop. Israel got itself in a predicament because it started looking at how the world operated. And since the world has a king, we want a king. We don't want the priests and the prophets to rule us. We want a king like everybody else. Can I tell you, the church gets in trouble when we begin to measure success the same way the world measures success. We get in trouble when we follow the crowd. God didn't call us to follow the crowd. He called us, called us to follow the cloud. When God brought them out of Egypt, they weren't following the crowd. They were following the cloud. Do I have anybody in here that's trying to follow the glory of God? That they're not worried about what's hip or what's cool or what's in or what's out. They're saying, God, just give me your presence and I'll go with it. If it's in a tent, I'll shout. If it's in a church, I'll roll with it because I'm not about to I'm about the cloud because God doesn't need a big crowd to move. In fact, Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, he said, I'll be there in the midst of them. We get in trouble when we begin to operate by the way of the world. How many people are you running? How big is your church? How many people attend this? And how many people you got that? How many people do you have on the registry? We are not called to do things the way the world does things. And anytime you study your Bible, the people of God begin to act like the people of the world. Things begin to fall apart. Anytime they quit seeking him and try to act like them, things begin to fall apart. And the people of Israel, they begin to try to just be like everybody else. Can I tell you, God didn't call you to be like everybody else. So God called you to be you. God didn't, that's why so many people are missing their anointing. They feel the pressure to be somebody else. I can never be T.D. Jakes. So I can never be Rob Parsons. I can never be Stephen Burdick. But I'm the best Barry Absher you're ever going to hear preach. You've got to be comfortable being who God called you to be. I'm just trying to tell somebody it's okay to be you. We get in trouble when we miss when we miss this and when we miss what God is doing. Let me tell you, man, God is not going to judge me by what I do in public. It's by what I do in private. It's not when I get up here and the anointing is flowing. But God looks for somebody that will seek him in private. Not when the crowd is watching. Not when the applause are present. But when nobody is watching. That's who God's looking for. And that's what gave rise to David. And I'll get to it in a little bit. But they went looking for a man that would look right. For a man that would look like king. And they found a man that was a head taller than any other man in Israel. He was almost a giant in his own right. He was a muscular man. He had that leadership quality. He had that strong jawbone. Everything you would want in a king. And they said, that's the man we want to be our king because the nations of the earth will look at Saul and say, behold, their king. So they raised him up. 
And Saul became king. But not long after that, they, the Bible records that in all the days of Saul, they never sought the Lord. All the days that Saul was king, they never stopped once to ask God what he wanted to do. I worry about church programs and church agendas that never take the time to sit back and say, God, what are you wanting to do in the service tonight? God, who are you wanting to bless tonight? God, how do you want us to sing? God, how do you want us to preach? Would you just lift your hands if you know we still need to ask God for his presence and his guidance in our life? It troubles me how many Christians just go by what they want and they never take time to consult God on what God will have for their life. I promise you, if you ask him, he will reveal it to you. But so many times we don't ask God his will. We ask God to get us a way out of what we've done wrong and ask God to make it right. Where if we would have taken the time to say, God, what would you have me do? God would have led you around that problem. Come on, somebody. God is raising up a generation that wants to seek the face of God again and say, God, what would you have me do on my job? God, what would you have me do in my marriage? God, what would you have me do in my life? Saul never saw as a nation, never led them to seek the presence of God and what God would want them to do. In Saul's first major exploit, God told Saul, he said, kill them all. Kill the women, the children. He said, destroy everything. Now that seems cruel, but there's a spiritual application. God was saying, Saul, anything left that could destroy my purpose in you, I want you to kill it. I'm going to preach a little bit right here. Because there's some places in life that you need God to kill some things so that the real thing God in you, that God put in you, can come out. Every now and then, I don't need to be pastor. Every now and then, I don't need to be preacher. I need to be around some people that can keep me humble. I need to be around some people that can keep me grounded. That's why God gave you family. Because they don't care how much money you have in your business. They don't care how many people know your name. They remember when you was five years old, pick a mother. It was Jesus that said a prophet is without honor in his own hometown. And we think that's a bad thing. But can I tell you, maybe God enough people in your life to remind you that you put your riches on just like them so that you didn't get so haughty and so high-minded ever talking to anybody. Every now and then we need a reminder that we're not all that in a bag of chips. Say amen somebody. And Saul didn't kill it. He didn't kill it all. He killed some of it, but he didn't kill it all. And so God begins to deal with Saul and he begins to get aggravated at Saul because Saul won't do what God wants him to do. And then Saul barges into a certain point and he needs a sacrifice to be made. They tell Samuel, the prophet, the only one eligible to make the sacrifice, that he needs to come, the priest, to come and make the sacrifice. But he delays. And when Saul saw that God wasn't moving on his timetable, he missed God. I'm about to preach it here. Because so many times when God don't move when we want him to move, that's when we mess up and do stuff on our own. Can I tell somebody that delay is not denial? And maybe the reason the door is not opening right now is because God sees something on the other side of the door you don't see that he's taken care of so that when he does open the door, he blesses you and doesn't wreck you. And so many times we miss the timing of God. You can be called to marry somebody but not do it at the right time. Mm -hmm. Me and Carlene were called. We felt that. To be married. You know, God never come down out of no ceiling and said, thou shalt marry Carlene. Carlene, thou shalt marry Barry. But we felt it in our spirit. But Carlene had some growing up to do. <laughs> so we were broke up, not for one month, not for two, for two months, but for 14 months. She was dating another guy serious, and I was engaged to a girl. And we get, I was, thought I was getting married to that girl. I was miserable, but I thought that's what I was doing. And for 14 months, we were broke up. But when we got back together, we realized that we had done some growing in that 14 months. And that we were indeed called to be married, but we almost missed the timing. So God had to pull us away so he could get us together at the right time after he had taken some things off of us or we would have sabotaged what God was doing in us. I'm preaching right now. There is a timing to the purpose of God. God is cultivating you for what he has called you to walk in. And sometimes you got to walk it out. Somebody say walk it out. And Saul couldn't handle the timing of God when God didn't move when he wanted to 
moved. He got mad and then Saul did the unthinkable. Saul went ahead and went in and made the sacrifice. He did something he wasn't anointed to do. Can I tell you that's where many churches miss it? That's why you've got storefront churches with two or three people and it's the wife and the son and the daughter listening to their dad and their husband because he got mad because nobody would let him preach so he decided he was going to preach all by himself and now there's no anointing and no spirit of God on him all because he tried to do something God Almighty didn't call him to do or preaching about right now. God wants somebody to learn how to stay in their lane. Stay in the thing God anointed you to do. The reason I don't grab the microphone and sing is because I wasn't anointed to do it and it would run you out of here. I've seen people get in trouble when they try to do something that God didn't give them the grace to do. But I have seen the Holy Ghost fall when people walk in the grace God gave them. And can I tell you what God called you to do? He gave you the grace to do it. I wish somebody would get with me tonight. He gave you the grace to be in that marriage. He gave you the grace to raise that family. He gave you the grace to stay in your lane. Saul tried to do something. He wasn't anointed to do. Y'all all seen people do stuff that they wasn't no anointing to do. And you just suffered through it. And you've endured it. You've been like, oh, Jesus, help us all. Saul, when he did that, God lifted his hand. He said, I'm done with Saul. God removed his spirit from Saul. And the Bible said an evil spirit began to vex and begin to torment Saul. And some of the most bitter people you see in the church today, they got that Saul spirit on them because the people at one time in their life, they were anointed to do something, but they missed God's time. They were anointed to do something, but they tried to do something God didn't call them to do. And they got stuck up in their own way rather than God's way. And there Saul said he was angry, he was mad, he was bitter, and he was tormented. And God spoke to Samuel and he said, I'm about to raise up another king. I want you to go to the house of Jesse and I want you to anoint the king. And so he goes to the house of Jesse and he said, God sent me here because I'm to anoint one of your sons as king. Y'all know the story. Right before Samuel got to the door, God said, don't look on the outward appearance, but look, let me speak. He said, because I look on the heart. Can I tell you, I thank God Almighty that he still looks on the heart. There are other people that would have judged you and thrown you away, but God didn't let them touch you because he saw something in your heart they didn't see. And they saw your mistake, but God saw something in you that was still reaching for him, and God didn't let destruction come. God didn't let disaster come. They bring up the first son of Ben and Dad, and he looks strong, and he looks tough, and he looks intelligent. But God said he ain't the one. The second son, the third son, the fourth son, the fifth son, the sixth son, seventh son. Everybody say seven. Seven, seven is the number of perfection, the number of completion, the number of endings. And after seven sons, Samuel finally looks at Jesse and said, you got another boy somewhere? And he said, I got an eighth son, but he's crazy. He's out in the field. We don't let him in here much because he don't act like everybody else. And Samuel said, that's the one I want. Because eight is the number of new beginnings. David was the eighth son prophetically because God didn't want to repeat an old thing. God wanted to do a new thing. I'm preaching right now. God wants to do a new thing in your life. He doesn't want you going around the same mountain and having the same struggle. God wants to do something they ain't never seen before. God wants to do something you ain't never walked him before. And God said, I'm going to anoint the eighth son. And Samuel takes the horn of oil. This is what got me about me. That horn was full of oil. But the horn symbolized death. Can I tell you that there will be no anointing until something dies? Help me preach it to the yes. That we want anointing, but anytime there's an anointing, there's going to be a death of something. That any time God did something, there was first the death. Can I tell you that God wanted many sons, but before there could be many sons, he had to sacrifice his only begotten son. And that released an anointing that turned the world upside down. Let me bring it down to where we're at. Last night, I needed Carly to go with me. We've had a lot of stuff going on. I said, baby, please go with me. She said, I want to go. We went to Bozavan to preach. And it was a crowded church. We walked in. And as soon as we walked in, I saw a former preacher, former colleague, an older statesman in the Bible or in the, in the gospel. As soon as we walked in, I said, he don't like me. 
Because I knew him from way back. And I said, Lord, have mercy. What have I got myself into? I'm, I'm trying to preach this revival. This guy's helping with the service because of his community revival. And here's a preacher that don't like me. And I looked over at Carlene. I said, Carlene, he don't like me. And she said, would you stop that? I said, I'm just telling you, he don't like me. And so I'm sitting there the whole time. I'm thinking, he don't like me. And my flesh is saying, you need to change the message. He never thought you were smart enough. He never thought you were good enough. He never this. He never that. But I knew what God had called me to preach. I knew why I'd been sent there. And I said, God, I'm going to do what I feel like you put my heart to do. But give me the grace to do it. And God put a message in my mouth called silent warfare. I preached it here. And I began to preach about the stuff that you go through that you don't tell nobody about. And I never looked at it the whole time I was preaching because I didn't want to see him frowning and I didn't want to see him shaking his head like I was missing it. So I began to preach and the Spirit of God began to flow and the oil began to flow and God began to move and when the service was over, I saw him walking up to me and I said, oh man, here we go. He's going to tell me everything I did wrong. He began to weep like a baby and he said, you came for me. He said, because I've been sleeping with a shotgun under my bed, contemplating blowing my brains out for the last three nights and I couldn't tell nobody. He said, but God put a word in your mouth that has helped this old preacher out. I said, thank you, Jesus. God had to kill my pride. He had to kill my fear. But when I got past myself, oil began to flow. Can I tell you, oil wants to flow in your life. Oil wants to flow. I would have let the devil talk me out of somebody God called me to minister. What if I had changed the message based on what I was feeling in my flesh? God wouldn't have done what he wanted to do in that man's life. I didn't know I'd been sent there for him. In fact, I thought he was the one person that wouldn't listen to a word coming out of my mouth. Little did I know he was the one person that needed it the most. Ain't that just like the enemy to try to separate you from those you're assigned to? To try to separate you from those that you've been called to help and those that you've been called to deliver and those that you've been called to be used of God to heal. But I thank God that the oil flowed. When David got under that horn of oil, it began to flow for him. It didn't flow for the first seven sons, but it recognized David. Can I tell you, your anointing recognizes you. That's why you don't have to be anybody else. God won't anoint me if I try to be T.D. Jakes. But if I'll be who I am, my anointing will recognize me and come upon me. I'm trying to tell you, God wants you to be you. And that oil flowed upon David from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. And from that day forward, David knew he was called. I'm hoping you leave this church tonight without that spirit of fear because you know you're called. Because you know you're chosen. There was something on David that said, the devil can't kill me because God's called me. The devil can't destroy me because God's called me. I was on a plane one time. I told you and I was afraid it was going to go down. And the person with me was afraid it was going to go down. I said, this plane can't go down because I'm on it. Jill Absher, anytime she was with us on a plane or in a vehicle, she said, I feel safe if I'm in this plane or in this vehicle with Barry because I know we can't die because God's got a plan on Barry's life. She was telling Connie that one time. And Connie goes, he's got a plan for Charlie too. I said, yes, he does. But when you know you got a plan of God on your life, you ain't got to worry about the stuff everybody else worries about. You say, I can't die right now. There are too many prophecies over me. I can't die right now. God ain't done with me. Josh, you can't die right now. Y'all just getting started with you. Come on, somebody. You can't give up right now. God's got too much to do in your life for you to die. Who devil don't like preaching like this? You can't die, Cody. You got too much in you, boy. The devil don't want you to hear stuff like this because when you know what you're packing, it drives off fear. It makes the enemy have to step back and say, what am I going to do with this guy? How am I going to mess with this guy? So when David bursts on the scene, he had already been anointed, and he can't figure out why God's mighty army is hiding in fear at the sound of the weatherman. Goliath, who they got a false report of doom, damnation and destruction. I wonder how many false voices have been released into your life to get you to hide in that place of fear. <laughs> David never measured how high Goliath was. David didn't have to. David measured the promise of God on his life and 
said one of the most powerful phrases in the whole Bible. He said, is there not a cause? He didn't say how big's Goliath. He didn't say how many people's going to get mad. He said, is there not a cause? The reason we have greeters is because there's a cause. The reason we have ushers is because there's a cause. The reason we want to connect with people after they get saved is because there is a cause. And when you realize everything you do unto the Lord, there is a cause for it. David said, there's a cause for me to fight Goliath. He's trying to defy the armies of the living God. And can I tell you, God is raising up some Davids in this generation that are going to do it because it's right. That are going to do it because it gives God glory. They're not going to ask how many people want them to do it or don't want them to do it. They're going to say, I'm going to do it because I'm not going to let anything defy God's purpose in my life. He said, I'm not measuring Goliath. I'm standing against him. And David said, ah, I ain't scared of him. He said, my God doesn't deliver me from the lion and the bear. What was he saying? He said, my God has done help me win the private battle. And God didn't help me win all the private battles for me to die in the public battle. That's a word for somebody right now. All the private stuff you can't tell your neighbor that God did to you. God didn't do all that stuff for you behind closed doors for you to wilt away now. God didn't bring you through what he brought you through for you to give up now. God brought you through the God that brought you through back then. He's going to bring you through again. And David realized God don't start a work unless he's going to finish a work. And he said, if he was with me when nobody's looking, he's going to be with me when everybody's looking. And he began to preach and he began to prophesy. And they took David into the presence of the king. Tallest man in Israel. Saul was almost as tall as Goliath. Saul was a mighty man. In all actuality, Saul had what it took physically to go down in that valley and do battle with Goliath. The problem was, when you get detached from the anointing, you forget who you are. If the enemy can separate you from the people of God, from the sound of God, from the spirit of God, you, my friend, will develop spiritual amnesia. And you'll forget who you are. You'll forget how much you matter to God. You'll start running from things you've never ran from. You'll start hiding from things you've never hidden from when you forget who you are. The enemy would love it, Cody, if you'd forget who you are. The enemy would love it, Leanne, if you would forget who you are. Here you find Saul, this once anointed king. He's done so removed from knowing who he is. He's tormented by evil spirits. And it takes the playing of David to drive back those evil spirits. Now, I want to see how many honest people I've got in here. How many of y'all listen to music other than Christian? Thank God for you for Brad, Kelly, and Amy, and Josh. Look at you, Josh. You better be amazing. And your preacher. Did you know that secular music is a multi-billion dollar industry? That people play music because it's, it's proven that music puts them in a peaceful place for the most part? That it takes them to another place in their mind. Music is one of the most powerful forces on the planet. I'm preaching right now. The sound that is released, that's why they make millions and billions of dollars. If they can do music good because music didn't come from the devil, music came from God. The enemy might have hijacked it, but God created good music. Say amen, somebody. And all David had to do was he didn't get in there and play good music. He wasn't playing Eminem. He wasn't playing country. He wasn't playing Blake Shelton. No, sir. When he went in there, he was playing stuff like Cody was playing. He was playing music that lifted up the name of the Lord. And when he would play that music, it would drive back the evil spirits. It would drive back that oppression. The reason we sing before we preach is not to entertain you. It's we're trying to drive off everything that would distract you so that you can get a word in here that will help you. Come on, somebody. That's what we do. He said, you're going to wear an armor. Now, tall, Saul's the tallest man in Israel. And David is young and ruddy. And the Bible says he's a good-looking countenance. But he ain't nowhere near as big as Saul. And he tries to put that armor on, and he can't move. See, Saul wasn't worried about David. Saul was saying, if he wins the battle, I'll get credit. And if he loses the battle, I'll have one more day to escape. Saul was just trying to take care of Saul. He wasn't trying to take care of David. And you always have to realize that always will be some people that are going to try to use you for their own selfish motives that don't really care about you. And David got in that armor and he said, I can't use this stuff. 
I've not tried it. He said, I can only be who I am. And I can only use what I've always used. So he shed that armor and he went down to the creek. And he found them five smooth stones. And I don't have time to preach what those stones represent. But five is the number of grace. And five is also the number of fivefold ministry. And those stones he didn't get from a cliff. He got them in a river. Why? Because a stone in the river has all the rough edges pushed off of it and washed off of it. So that when you release it, it'll fly right. I'm preaching right now. See, you can have a gift in you. But if you don't get in the river, you'll have too many rough edges. And you'll miss your mark. But if you're in a church where the Spirit of God is flowing... He'll wash away your pride. He'll wash away your anxiety. And that way when God releases you, you will hit your mark. Is there anybody that knows there is a river that may glad the city of that God? I said there is a river that may glad the city of that God. Do you remember when Paige used to sing it, Pam? I remember when he sang it at Souls Harbor. And I've come to tell the devil, there's still a river that makes glad the city of our God. It's the only way I know, y'all. He got those five smooth stones. He faced the Philistine. The Philistine faced David. They started jawing back and forth. The Philistine started cursing David, making fun of God. And David just looked at him and said, you're going to die today. David said, my God's going to get some glory from this. And this now, David, not yesterday, not tomorrow, but this boy that knew how to operate in the night. Somebody just say now. Now. He stood there and he said, God has brought me for now. It's not about where I've been and who yet believe in me. It's not about what will happen tomorrow. It's about right now. Say now. now. And in the now, David knew that now God is with him. So another be a Can I tell you that now God is with you? David released that stone. That had been in the river. And that stone hit Goliath right between the eyes. It didn't hit him in the heart. It didn't hit him in the elbow. It didn't hit him in the abdomen. But it hit that giant right between the eyes. Why? Because the giants we face don't live out here. They live right between our ears. But when we get in the anointing of the Holy Ghost, God will release a word that will hit us right between the ears and knock down our worry and knock down our fear and knock down our doubt. But David didn't stop when he knocked him down. David marched on up to him and he took the very sword that Goliath was going to kill him with and he chopped his head off. I've come to tell somebody, don't come to church and get just enough relief for God to knock down your problem. Let God cut the head off of that thing tonight. God said, David, take the thing that was going to kill you and use it for my victory. I've seen God, as Cody begins to play, I've seen God take things that were meant to kill me and use them to increase my anointing. If you pick up the very thing that the devil was using, he'll give you the anointing. Trying to help somebody else. And he chopped the head off of that child. It's now, David. And he didn't start worrying about tomorrow. And he didn't start fussing about yesterday. He got in the palace of the king and Jonathan saw him. Jonathan was dressed like a prince an heir to the throne. And David was dressed like a little ruddy shepherd boy. But Jonathan knew where David was going. Jonathan sensed the anointing on his life. In fact, Jonathan would prophesy, you're going to be the next king, not me. And right there in that moment, Jonathan took off his royal robes and he took those filthy rags that David had on his body. Can I tell you that's what Jesus did for us? So he took our sin and our shame and he gave us his very righteousness. And when God looks at us, he don't see who we used to be. He sees who God called us to be in Christ. That's why the Bible says you are hidden with Christ in God. The devil would love to dig up your past and bring it before God. But the devil can't find it because it's under the blood of Jesus. It's hidden in who Jesus is. And the devil can't find who you used to be because you are who God says you are. And you have what God says you have. Quit being fretful over yesterday. Begin to just praise God now. Begin to say, God, thank you that I'm living right now. I'm tired of living in regret. I'm tired of living in shame. Then David goes on. Saul tries to kill him because when there's an anointing on your life, not everybody's going to be happy about it. Saul tries to kill him. And you find it going to the priest in 1 Samuel 21. 
And he eats. He eats the holy bread. His men that are with him eat. The priests feed them. But he says, I need something. He says, well, there's something. There's a weapon. But it's behind all the old rags that we throw away. This now David goes into the closet of the ephods that the priest used to use that thrown away. And he says, there's something good in it. Can I tell you, there's a generation rising up even now that are going to begin to pick up stuff that church has thrown away. Me and Carlene stood in that service last night. And they didn't sit, they sung songs that were 20 years old. They didn't have a format or agenda. They didn't have a sanctuary that looked like this. But the power of God was in that place because they had thrown everything away. It troubles me with churches today throwing away stuff that God never said throw away. I'm not going to throw away my prayer. I'm not going to throw away my belief that God's able. I'm not going to throw away the word of God. There's a generation that is going to pin us through the stuff that others have thrown away. And they're going to say, the still an anointing on it. There's still an anointing on fireball preaching. There's still an anointing on a congregation that will get with you. And God is raising up some people that are pillaged through the stuff they throw away. It was Jeremiah who was thrown in the sewer system. But there was a man of God in Lillian and he gathered up the old rags that everybody had thrown away. And he threw it down in that sewer pit and he brought out Jeremiah. What does that say? God is raising up a generation in this hour that are going to pick up the stuff that others have thrown away and use it to bring people up out of their oppression. Oh, can I prophesy a little bit longer and tell you that God specializes in raising up people that others have thrown away and using them to pull other people out of the pit. My God takes the world's trash and turns it into the kingdom's treasure. Give him a hand clap of praise if you know what I'm talking about. Everybody stand and I feel something in this place. I'll never get over that last night when that old preacher that I just knew hated me when he walked up to me with those tears in his eyes and he said, boy, you came for me. There was something in me at that because I had to have Carlin. He didn't know what I was going through. He didn't know what I was going on. And I didn't know what he was going to. And all I know is that when we got together, God took what was in me and he made us for him. Can I tell you, God is going to take what's in you and minister to others. God, don't throw away the stuff that others have thrown away. They might be throwing away their prayer life, don't throw away your prayer life. They might be throwing away their church attendance, don't throw away your church attendance. They might be saying, oh, it's just me and Jesus. You ain't got to go to church. You ain't got to do all that. Don't throw away the stuff that works. I want you to lift your hands to God right now. Because there's some stuff I learned a long time ago that still works. And praise of God still works. Giving God the glory still works. The tragedy of anything that I preach to you tonight is this. Jonathan recognized the anointing in David, but he never could fully break ties with Saul, his father. And there comes a place that this now David has to bury the bones of Saul and Jonathan. And he weeps because the Bible said he loved him more than the love of women. They were best friends. They were like brothers. And Jonathan should have been with David. But Jonathan couldn't let go of what God used to use and fully embrace what God was raising up. And can I tell you, there's going to be some people you love and you love greatly, and they love you. But they're not going to be able to fully let go of everything from yesterday. And not everybody that starts with you is going to finish with you. And that's okay. Not everybody that starts on the journey with you is going to finish with you. We want them to. I wish I still had the people with me when me and Carly first got saved. They were all on fire. It was a young adult ministry. Everybody was on fire. But not all of them are now. Some of them are. But some of them don't go to church anymore. Because they couldn't fully let go of what was to embrace what is. I want you to lift your hands to God tonight. God's given you the grace to let go. In the name of Jesus, we let go of shame. We let go of fear. We let go of doubt. Mm. We let go of the opinions of other people. There's a let go. Oh, 
how the stress goes when you just let it go. Let it go. I'm preaching to me too, y'all. Let it go. Y'all feel a peace in here right now? Just stay in that atmosphere. Let it go. Quit holding on to that regret. Let it go. Quit holding on to the memory of that broken relationship. Let it go.